just by way of introduction, I talked with Matt this morning and I said, hey, I've got, <laughs> I've got your CV. Do we want to do all of that? And he says, no, he says, I'll, I'll take care of that. But I want to I want to give a warm welcome to uh, Matthew D. Church. Matt Church, most of you know him out there. He's a partner at uh, Manning Curtis Bradshaw and Bednar, and he is definitely a partner with the trust. We worked with Matt uh, for some time working on our uh, legal hotline and various different things, as well as defense. And so that's all the all the introduction that uh, that he wanted, um, even though his list and credentials are very long there. So we want to turn the time over to Matt Church. All right, everybody hear me okay? I assume that's a yes. I did want to take control of my own narrative there. I don't know who wrote my bio, but I'd like to, to tell you who I am, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, as mentioned, the trainings on contractual risk and the transfer of contractual risk. My perspective is a little bit different than maybe you've had this training before. I'm a litigator. Generally speaking, 90% of my day is in the courtroom. It's with lawsuits and specifically lawsuits from municipal entities. And most of these lawsuits have a contractual component to them. So my perspective will be a little different than your in-house counsel or maybe your city attorney or your county attorney, whoever you go to for general advice. It's not that they're wrong and I disagree with them. It's just that we look at things differently because I am looking at these contracts and these terms at the very end, the finish line, back when we're in the lawsuit. And so my perspective will be a little bit different. Historically, I'll just tell you who I am, what I do. Although most of you know who I am um, from that hotline or from a lawsuit that we've dealt with. Again, my name is Matt Church. Some of you know my dad, David Church. Uh, I've been doing municipal law my entire career. I originally started working with him in his law office. And uh, if anybody's worked with their parent, you know that uh, went great, obviously. And uh, then after a couple of years, I moved over to a litigation-centric firm where I did injury claims, contract claims, all defense work, but wasn't necessarily municipal related. After I did that for a couple of years, I decided that my real passion was similar to my dad. I wanted to represent municipal entities. But when I say represent municipal entities, I did not want to sit in your city council meetings. I did not want to do what my dad did. Uh, it, it was too tough for me. And so I wanted to combine my love for litigation uh, with the, my passion for municipal government or local government. And so that's what I've been doing. Now, nearly for um, eight years, I've done almost exclusively just municipal litigation, which means I represent cities, counties, special service districts, and employees when they're sued. The reason I don't do 100% of litigation is because I'm also hired quite a bit to do employment investigations or consulting on contracts pre-litigation. Um, that could mean you'd hire me to help you negotiate an agreement with your local council or conduct an independent third-party investigation of a grievance or some sort of sexual harassment claim. That's how most of you have heard from me or heard of me. When the trust gets a claim, I'm on their list and I'll be one of the people hired to represent you or your entities. And so I hope that you never have to uh, deal with me in that situation. If we do a good job in these trainings, we can avoid some of those risks. So that's a little bit of background about who I am and what perspective I bring to this particular training, contractual risk. I bring the perspective of everything goes wrong and everything's horrible all the time. And that's a different perspective than you're gonna get because I recognize that most contracts work out. Most of the times you don't have to sue anyone. The indemnity provisions or the additional insured provisions seem to make sense. But I'm here to tell you and help you with the times that it doesn't. As we mentioned, I'm gonna jump into some topics. And if you have questions in those topics, I'd prefer we address those as we go because some of these topics aren't gonna be related. If you wanna wait till the end, that's fine too. Uh, but that chat, uh, I think Jason will check that and I'll try to keep an eye on it as well now that we're all used to Zoom. Uh, it's not the hardest thing in the world for me to multitask on that. As we do these, if you have questions or you, you want to heckle me a little bit, go ahead and put it in the chat. I'm comfortable with that situation as well. So where do we start? Uh, I'm going to come in and out of sharing a PowerPoint presentation. It won't be the whole time, um, but I do want to go over a couple slides. This is our topic today, contractual risk transfer and the good tips for drafting these contracts. I wanna begin with a story. 
Now I've got this incredible law clerk. He's just arrived at our a law office from Wake Forest named Simon. And as I was talking with him about this presentation, he reminded me of the first year contracts course. Now I know that not all of you are lawyers on here. Um, and if you are, maybe you've forgotten first year contract, but there's a famous case. This famous case is uh, about contracts. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it'll be kind of just a short example. There was a contract uh, to, for chicken. There was a chicken seller and a chicken buyer. And I assume this was in the 50s. They worked hard to hash out that agreement. And one wanted to sell chicken and the other wanted to buy chicken. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, this seems like a pretty straightforward transaction. And I think they did too, because everyone knows what chicken is, right? Well, the chicken buyer was trying to buy chicken uh, to use in chicken broiling and frying and boiling and food service. Chicken seller didn't know that. And chicken seller selling a different type of chicken, like live chickens. And we're talking a big amount of chickens here. And so after they execute this contract, they send it off. Uh, chicken buyer gets you know a million dollars worth of live chickens. That's not what he expected. Uh, he says, hey, you've breached your agreement. You have promised to give us chicken and we were gonna use that chicken for frying and boiling. And they say, no, we didn't. Uh, you, we promised to give you chicken and you get, you, we gave you chicken. Now, I don't have the facts like Simon does and he can correct me at the end, but you can see why this example is an interesting one and studied in first year contract courses. Both of the parties believed that they understood what the contract was about, chicken. But, but it wasn't, right? Neither of the parties got what they wanted. There's two lessons from this. The first one's obvious. The first one is you should be careful with what you're drafting, right? All of us believe that we're being clear. I think that I present things uh, super clear and that you can understand everything. And then afterwards, I'll have a client say, I didn't understand what you're talking about. Uh, same thing with your drafting. You'll call somebody on a contract, whatever it's about. You'll think it's clear and it won't be. So the first lesson, I think everyone can understand, you don't have to be in first year contracts to know this is an ambiguity question. One party meant live chickens, the other meant chicken parts for boiling or frying. And if they'd have put that in the contract, we could have saved a lot of time and money, but they didn't. The second lesson we learned from this chicken case is a little bit more nuanced. And I think it applies specifically to you as members. After this lawsuit was filed, and the lawyers fought it. Somebody was right. I don't remember first year contracts as well as I should have because I was uh, playing internet backgammon most of the time, but uh, I, I believe that the chicken buyer won this case. They were right based on the context of the deal, the terms in the contract, the things that were said in the negotiation, the chicken buyer was clear. It should have been chicken parts and not live chickens and the chicken seller was an idiot and they were wrong. And so after years of litigation, chicken buyer was validated. Congratulations, you won your lawsuit. That is the most common mistake I see made in contract claims. I will get a member call me either in the negotiation phase or in the end and say, Matt, there is ambiguity, but it's clear what I meant. And if we get a lawsuit, I'm going to win. And you're probably right. We almost always win lawsuits. And if we don't win, we settle them. That's not the point. And if you've heard my trainings before, you'll hear it again. My message to you is the punishment is the process. Even getting in the lawsuit means you have already lost. It is a miserable experience. Uh, and even if you're right and you will be vindicated in the end, you will regret your time in the lawsuit. So if we can do things on the front end to avoid lawsuits, to resolve ambiguities, to get deals done, we have to do everything that we can to get that done. And that's what this training will hopefully do, It'll help you avoid lawsuits. All right, so how do we do this? Well, there's a couple things that I wanna start out with. The importance of good contract drafting. There's a couple keys to good contract. We're gonna cover them today. 
The first, risk mitigation. There are certain risks that you take. Now, I don't know all of the group that's listening today. We've got a ton of you on there and we've got more that'll listen to it later. I'm going to give an example of a contract and we're gonna work through it, but it won't apply to your job. I know that. There's a million different types of contracts that apply to your job. Fortunately, the general contract principle will apply to almost every deal. So for example, I don't know if it is a rental of a, a government facility. I don't know if it's a development agreement with a land use thing. I don't know if it's a severance agreement or an employment contract. I don't know if this is a traditional goods and services agreement. We are going to talk about all of them. Your job involves contracts. Those contracts may be for a bunch of different things. Yes, there are specifics that will apply to specific contracts, but I'm here to talk about general ideas and principles that you can apply to all of your stuff. So risk mitigation is the first reason and why we need a contract. There are certain risks involved in every contract, and we're going to talk about how to mitigate those risks, eliminate them. The second is legal compliance. There are some things you can't do without a contract. This isn't just your internal compliance, although I hope you have it. Certain agreements require contracts. We should use those as certain agreements, but you have to have a contract to be in compliance. Third is cost of efficiency. We talked about this with our chicken example. You may be winning the case in the end, but is it efficient to spend money on litigation? Could we resolve the ambiguities early to save money later? Yes. And then fourth, certainty and predictability. You will need to have a clear understanding of what your terms are if we're going to jump into this type of contract. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute because it's easier to pay attention if you can see me. Uh, I can't see you, but I assume that you're all listening. Uh, I like to picture you taking notes even if I know that you're probably on the golf course or something like that. I wanna talk about that hypothetical I promised. We're gonna go over a couple principles today and I want you to be picturing a hypothetical contract. They'll be easier for the application of some of those principles that we just talked about. This particular hypothetical is you are a city or a county or an entity. I'm gonna say city because it's easier for me to pick one. And you have some baseball fields. And while you may run city rec leagues and things like that, that's not what we're talking about. You get approached by a beer league. You know, I'm talking old people, Uncle Rico style. Uh, they want to set up some sort of softball league and they want to use your fields. And they're going to come to you and they're going to say, we'll pay you some money and we'd like you to give us some time to use those fields. Now, this is not a stretch. I can predict from my experience that this happens all the time in some way or fashion. And I will also know that if you're hearing that example, many of you are saying, Matt, we don't need a contract. That's easy. Just take the money, let them use the fields. And I understand and I recognize why you have that inclination. First, it's easier. Uh, probably has never come up in the past that it's an issue. And your city attorney's busy or your county attorney's busy, or maybe they don't have a specialty in this particular thing. You don't have a form. You don't want to call Matt Church or pay him, do any of that stuff. And so you just work without one. What's our first problem with that? The very first problem. Before risk mitigation, before certainty and predictability, before cost efficiency, before the ambiguities we've just talked about, the very first problem with you not getting a contract in that particular situation is whether you believe it or not, just because you don't have a written contract does not mean you do not have an agreement. Just because you don't have a written agreement does not mean you don't have a contract. You do. You'd still do. It may be oral, but you've got one. And so you, you think I'm making this way easier by not putting things in writing. What you're really doing is making things much more complicated if things go sideways. What you've done by saying, yes, you can use our field. We will pay, you will pay us money. We will give you field time is you've created all sorts of ambiguity in the specifics of the agreement. If, for example, they called up and said, we're going to use it four nights a week. And you said, you can't do that. And they'd say, why? You say, well, that wasn't our deal. And they'd say, prove it. 
Now, that may be, seem simple, and you'd say Uncle Rico would never do that. He understands that we had an agreement. It's just one night a week. Sure, sure. What if the grass is really long, and they're really upset about it, and they say, we, we contracted with you for a short grass, and you didn't mow it. You say, that wasn't part of our deal. And they say, how do we know that wasn't part of the deal? That's an ambiguity created. Those are simple. Those are simple ambiguities. Those would come up, but you may be able to solve them. The scarier ones are Uncle Rico hits a foul ball into the stands. Somebody gets seriously hurt. Whose fault is it? What happens when they sue? What if Uncle Rico doesn't pay the referees? The umpires sue. Are they employees or contractors? Are they covered under your liability? Well, if we don't have a written agreement, we don't know. Are we gonna be able to win some of those arguments? Yeah, I think we can, right? I'll wear my best tie, we'll go to court, we'll tell the judge, this was dumb. Obviously they were not, didn't promise we'd pay the umpires. This is a beer league, it's theirs. I think I can win that case. But do you want to be in it? No, because the punishment is the process. So what I hope to do today is convince you, if nothing else, using some of these principles that we need written contracts. And if we need written contracts, there are three tools that I'd like to teach you how to use to make these contracts better. And we're gonna use Uncle Rico's example as a, as a stopping place. We're gonna use the beer league, but in reality, these apply to almost every single contract. So the first one is indemnification. The second is the duty to defend. And the third is an additional insured provision. Let's talk a moment while we're gonna dive into these, let's talk a moment to make sure we're all understanding the exact terms that I'm using here. Uh, we're, not, we're gonna dive in further, but I wanna make sure you get a complete overview of these three principles before we jump into them. Indemnification. What is indemnification? Think to yourself as you're listening, how is indemnification different than the duty to defend, the additional insured provision? Are they different? Or are they the same? I hear these three terms conflated a lot. They're actually very different. And as much as I hate to tell you this, certain magic words you use in your contract will trigger each of these three things. Even if you're not aware of these three things, the other side may be using these magic words to trigger certain obligations from your entity. So today we're gonna to talk about these and make sure you understand how to use them for your good and you know how to strike them from agreements you don't wanna do. So indemnification generally is the principle that if there's a claim made, that you will have them pay the damages that arise from that claim. If you agree to indemnify someone else, that means you agree to pay the damages that arise out of any claims. Now these indemnification agreements can be drafted broadly or narrowly, but generally speaking, an indemnification provision is we will pay the damages arising from X. You will pay the damages arising from Y, even if a different person is sued. So let's cover an indemnification example quickly on our beer league softball. If you had the beer league softball agree to indemnify you from any claims and somebody hit a foul ball and it, you know, knocked over a beer and they are suing for the cost of the beer, the person filing the lawsuit obviously would sue the league. Your obligation isn't triggered there. But what if they sue the city? saying you allowed them to use our field and they knocked over my beer. Well, if we have an indemnification provision, the league will indemnify the city, meaning they will pay any damages proved against the city in that situation. How is that different than the duty to defend? Well, the duty to defend is an additional duty in comparison to indemnification, where they will pay for your lawyer. So in the first example, you're still defending yourselves. And if you are found liable, the other side will pay your damages, but you still have to defend yourself. And so if we wanna trigger a duty to defend, that means 
if a claim's made, you're going to provide either an attorney or we're going to buy an attorney for you and you can pick them and they'll defend you in the claim or the lawsuit or whatever it is. So together, a duty to defend and indemnify would say they're going to pay for your attorney. And if the attorney loses, they're going to pay the damages. So how is that additional, different than an additional insured provision? An additional insured provision accomplishes some of those same things. It's a different way to get to the same end. It can be included in contracts as an addition to the duty to indemnify and defend, not a substitute for these. I've seen contracts that have any one of these three provisions or have all three of these provisions. But an additional insured says, you will put us on your insurance policy and we will get the, all the benefits you get under your insurance policy. Meaning in our example, the league would likely have an insurance policy and if not, you could mandate one in the contract and you would say, hey league, before you use our field, we want to see a certificate of insurance that says the city is insured under your policy. So how would this look in practice? Let's say you had all three of these things. You'd get a lawsuit it, because of a foul ball. The city has no involvement. They just simply allowed them to use the field. Without these provisions, you have to pay for your own attorney, prove it wasn't your fault. And if it was your fault or the jury doesn't like you for some reason, you're going to have to pay the damages. With an indemnification provision, they'd have to pay the damages. With the duty to defend and an indemnification provision, they'd pay your attorney and pay the damages with an additional insured. It's a different way to accomplish that. Their insurance agreement, if there's coverage, would give you insurance, which would trigger some sort of duty to defend with an attorney and indemnification. So you know how to use these to benefit you, but what about if other people ask for these things? You've gotta be very careful. We're gonna go over what kind of language we should agree to, but in general, as a government entity, you should, not agree to indemnify other parties. You should not agree to defend them. And you should not put them on your insurance. If you're going to do these things, we need to make sure our indemnification and our duty to defend language is very narrow. You're only going to indemnify and defend for very few claims arising out of only your actions. If you're going to choose to list somebody as an additional insured, you have to talk to your insurance company it's likely going to cost you money. It's not something you can promise to do and assume that it'll never come up. The law in Utah is if you agree to list somebody as an additional insured and you don't do it, either because you don't want to pay for it, you don't notify your insurance company, or for some other reason, then you have to step into the shoes of the insurance company. You do not want to insure, you do not want to become the insurance company in these contracts. So let's dive in specifically to the indemnification language and do a little bit of an activity here. What you are seeing is a sample indemnification provision. I'm going to give you a minute to read it if you'd like. As I mentioned, I'm assuming you're all uh, sitting on the edge of your seats here. I appreciate that the cameras are turned off. This is a sample indemnification provision. What the next few slides are gonna show you are how we should redline this agreement, what we would want to add. And each red line we're gonna add, we're gonna talk about why we're gonna add that. But right now I want you to read this provision, pretend this was your agreement. I've drafted it in a way that sets up our hypothetical, beer league, city. But I recognize you are not a beer league or a city. And so what does it read? The league agrees to indemnify the city from and against lawsuits caused by the league, unless the lawsuit is the result of the city's actions. Pretty straightforward. I would say I have seen this exact indemnification provision accepted by many of my government clients. How many errors can you spot here? What things would you look to change? Well, the first one's a layup. I just told you that indemnify is different than defend. 
So the first change here should be what? The league agrees to defend and hold harmless the city from and against lawsuits caused by the league. So what we've done here is we've said, well, wait a minute. We don't want you just to pay for the damages. We want you also to defend us if we're sued. Easy addition. Without that, you have half the protection you think you did. I told you, it's magic words. It's frustrating to non-lawyers, but it's real. So what's the next issue I would have with this agreement? The league agrees to indemnify, defend, and hold harmless the city from and against lawsuits. Who is covered under this agreement? The city. Well, that should bother you because none of you are the city, right? I would change it this way. We're going to defend and hold harmless the city and its agents, employees, and contractors. You do not want to be under the gun from the opposing side who they sue. Let's take an example from the beer league. You may be thinking this is legal mumbo jumbo. I understand why you'd think that, but having seen it on the front lines, this is why it matters. Beer league goes, uh, let's say uh, grass is too long. Somebody trips on the grass, tears their ACL. You've got an agreement that you're going to indemnify and defend. Uh, and you think, great, we're covered. They don't sue the city though. They sue the poor guy that mowed the lawn. Now, I understand we have immunity arguments. I'm not saying that, and I'm not talking about those now. What I'm saying is, if they chose to sue the guy that mowed the lawn instead of the city, they chose to name your employee. And again, you are these employees. Would there be coverage under this contract without this? No, probably not. I mean, it's an argument. And so if we can add this, it will broaden the scope so it doesn't just cover the city, but we're covering the employees, the agents, and the contractors. So are we done? Is that good now? Read through it. What do you think our next issue is? What We've now got what we're doing, and we've certainly got who's covered. What are they covered against? Lawsuits. Is that good enough? No. Lawsuits isn't good enough. We need to broaden that language. We would want to be covered from all lawsuits, claims, damages, loss, or expenses, including attorney fees. Lots of claims don't ever turn into lawsuits. If your indemnification provision is only triggered when somebody files a lawsuit, you could be left holding the bag here. We would need to be broadening this language so that it covers all types of the damages, the claims, and the losses. So are we done now? This one gets a little bit trickier. So we now know who's covered. We know what's covered. When does it get triggered though? It gets triggered only if the lawsuits, claims, damages, losses, or expenses are caused by the league. Is that gonna work for us? No, we want them to be a rising out of the leagues, out of this agreement. Caused by the leagues too narrow. Remember the grass growing, the referees not being paid, the foul ball falling in. Could this be technically caused by the league? Maybe, but we'd like broad language to encompass anything in the agreement. Remember the city in our example, isn't using the field. It's renting it to a third party league. Why would we want any claims related to the city? It's not our league. It's not our players. It's not our people. We want a rising out of this agreement. Do I think that's enough? I'd probably be okay with it, but I'd probably ask for even more or the league's use of the city's property. Because sometimes I would say, let's say the league leaves the field in a condition that is dangerous and you don't know about it. Now there's a hole in the baseball diamond and somebody falls in it. Is it a rising out of the agreement? maybe, but could we broaden this up to say, or the league's use of the city's property? Yes. All right, we've done quite a few red lines here, and I think that it's much better agreement, and it didn't take us that long. We went through in uh, maybe five, 10 minutes. Do you think it's perfect now? 
I would say that we could make one more change. I don't know if you'd be able to get away with it with the other side, but if the beer league's not very good, maybe. Let's change one more thing. Any ideas about what it would be? Yeah, there we go. Somebody in the comments. We're thinking along the same lines. Let's strike that unless the lawsuit is the result of the city's actions. That will limit our agreement, right? Because when a plaintiff sues, they are going to try to sue in the broadest sense. Meaning they will say, we are suing because there's a hole in the diamond and it's the league's fault. They'll acknowledge that. And then they'll say, alternatively, maybe it was the city's fault there was a hole there. And once they include that language, your contract is null and void. You didn't have the control over this agreement that you thought you did. Now, are we going to win? Yes. I've told you, that's not the point. I can win lots of lawsuits. That's not what we're training on. We're trying to avoid the lawsuits. If we struck this line, it's going to be very hard for the city to have to defend itself in this agreement. Now, is that realistic? I don't know. It, you know, like I said, if you're dealing with a beer league and they don't have counsel and they'll sign what you put in front of them, let's be the, the most aggressive. We've got a duty, a fiduciary duty to our clients and our citizens and our employer to get the best deal we can. This would be the best deal. If you've got to narrow it in a way that makes a little bit more sense, I'd change it this way. We've put the term back in there, but unless the lawsuit is a result of the city's actions, no, unless the result of the city is the sole negligence. Now I've litigated this exact phrase, sole negligence quite a few times. And what I would say is in our situation, we could say, look, even if we have a piece of the negligence, it wasn't solely our negligence, it's your job, not ours. So with those changes, we have changed a lot about the league. So when would this apply? This would apply to claims all over the place. You, we've now gone through this agreement, but I want you to broaden your understanding of when, what kind of agreement this is. Certainly, it's going to apply to first party questions. When I say first party, I mean if the league sues you, the field wasn't in the right condition, you didn't provide it on the right days, we would have this agreement. I think most people think through a contract from the first party perspective. If we don't do what we're supposed to and the other side sues us, we want this agreement. But I think there's a second way to apply it and that's to third parties. Now we've talked a little bit about this, poor person in the stands getting hit by a foul ball, uh, there's a car accident as the league's employees are leaving. There's a lot of different third party claims. It doesn't involve you or the league, but these third parties will likely sue the municipal entity along with the league. And so you'd like the city to be indemnified from that. And then there's an even additional, what I call fourth party claims. And you may not even be thinking about fourth party claims, but every time I go through a contract, I think about these. These are vicarious liability claims. This is what I was talking about with the referees not being paid. They'll sue their employer, they'll sue the league, and they'll say, city, it's our understanding they were working on your behalf, or they're your contractors, or maybe a player gets hurt in the league, and they sue the league, and then they sue the city as some sort of uh, vicarious liability claim. It's like a third-party claim, but it's different. They're suing you because they think you're in charge of the league. All these types of claims would be covered by our indemnity provision we just built. The final uh, language would look like this. And you, you know, it does not that, not that intimidating. We put it together pretty quickly. And I didn't mind the first language, the first indemnity provision, but you'll see this is how many changes we make. It takes a little bit of work. I recognize you're not uh, up for it all the time. And you may be thinking, but there's so many provisions in a contract, Matt, I don't have time to redline them like this. I'm here to tell you, there aren't that many that matter. That many of the contract provisions are irrelevant. Then there are three or four that are super important. This indemnification provision, triggering the duty to defend, 
is vital to your success as an entity. What we just went through is an exercise viewing what the city's obligations are, getting indemnified, getting defended. I want you also to think about the perspective of how much narrowing we could do if they were asking you to do the indemnifying or the defending. We would do the opposite of some of these red lines, right? We would say, no, 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 we're not indemnifying you from all claims. We're indemnifying you only from the city's use of the behavior or the city's work on this. I'm gonna move on to the additional insured provision. But before I do, I just want to make sure that I've covered all the indemnification questions that you've got. If you've got any in the, in the hopper on your chat, make sure to shoot them off now because I'd like to make sure we cover it uh, and not run out of time. I saw a couple of them um, as we went, and I think I've tried to answer those as we go. But if you've got any others, right now is the time. I'll still answer them again at the end, I promise. But. So folks, type those into the chat box and, and you can ask those questions right now. Matt, while we're waiting for that, just, uh, just one thing popped into my mind as we're going through there. Just because you have an agreement like this doesn't necessarily mean that you're off scot-free, right? If you have an unsafe condition in your facilities or something that you've done wrong, uh, that agreement made that contract may not get you out of it. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Jason. I, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, obviously, our advice is let's draft these as broad as you can. Let's get them on there and we'll try. But you're right. The difference between me working for Smith's Food and Drug and this, this various city is some of your obligations as municipalities are non-delegable. Meaning when you agree to do certain things, and this happens constantly with sidewalk claims, snow and ice removal, any of the trip and fall claims, I've probably done 50 of those for you guys. Uh, you may be able to say it's someone else's fault too. Someone else had a job to remove the ice, great. But the law requires you cannot delegate the safety of your public streets, roads, or sidewalks. And so as much as we want to push that off to someone else, like a sidewalk repair company or a snow and ice company, or maybe a neighboring landowner, like we say, hey, property owner, your tree did this. Good luck. You can try to give them some fault, and maybe that will help you reduce your damages, but you will not be able to get out of the lawsuit because you have a non-delegable duty under Utah law to defend these claims and keep them safe. And so it really is, if somebody is screwing that up, let's say a homeowner's tree is breaking the sidewalk or a snow and ice removal company is not doing their job, the onus is on the city to get them to do their job. You enforce your ordinances, get them to clean their stuff up because if a lawsuit comes, you're not gonna be able to shrug your shoulders and point the finger at them. Um, you're gonna have to defend that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the additional insured provision. Uh, and again, if there are questions about indemnity, happy to cover it. What is an additional insured provision and how is it different? How is it the same? Let me share my screen again and talk a little bit about that. So an additional insured provision, as we covered a, in the, a couple minutes ago, will trigger their insurance policy. So in our example we've been going over, the league will have an insurance policy and you will be covered under the beer league. I'm not talking when I say the league of the league of cities and towns, I'm talking about the beer league in our example here. Uh, your indemnity provision requires them to have money. Your additional insured provision requires them to have an insurance policy. That's a huge difference. I'm gonna say it again, because it really, really matters. You may think I'm covered. Matt told me to put an indemnity provision. I copied and pasted his from his slide. We're good. The contractors I have seen hired or the leagues or the people renting the facility, you are relying on fake protection if you only rely on indemnity. Why? Because they could go broke. And if they go broke, it's not gonna do us any good to chase them down later. You're saying you're going to indemnify us, you're going to cover us, and then they don't exist six months from now. It's good to have it. I'm not saying don't use indemnity provisions. We just spent 20 minutes on them. I'm saying the better, good, better, best, as Supreme Court Justice Oaks said, we have to list an additional insured provision as well. The additional insured provision will say you need to put us on your insurance policy. 
Now, if I could guess what's going on in your mind, you may be thinking, uh, what if they don't have insurance? Or what if their insurance is really bad? That should not be the reason you don't get an additional insurance provision. Why? Well, because if you're going to do a contract with the beer league, you should have in your contract, we are requiring you to cover this amount of insurance. You must list us as an additional insured and you must give us a certificate of insurance saying you did it. If they won't agree to that, don't do business with them. And if you're gonna do business with them, recognize you are taking the risk. I've had many entities say, I didn't include an additional insured provision because they didn't have insurance. And I said, why didn't you require them to get insurance? I didn't know I could. You can. You All you do is ask for it. Now, what does a sample insured provision look like? I'll show you. We're not going to redline this one. It's very simple. In this particular one, the city, its officers, employees, and contractors shall be named as an additional insured for all liability arising from the agreement. This would cover you in most circumstances. Now, there are better ways to do it. Yes, I'm gonna give you a couple tips and tricks just to make sure we get what we want in this. First, remember with an additional insured provision, you only get what's in their policy. Meaning if they have a bad policy, lots of exclusions, they don't have a lot of good coverage, they aren't covered for the specific thing they're doing, you aren't gonna be covered any either. Now, how do you fix this? What do you say? Gosh, man, I don't wanna read their insurance policies. How do I know they've got good insurance? Mandate specific coverage. Say specifically, you are using our fields for baseball. Your insurance should cover baseball. The limit should be X. No exclusion should prohibit Y. And if they do it right, then you've got that coverage. If they do it wrong, you have an argument that they breached the agreement. Insurance policies are great. We obviously all are insured in this room, but insurance policies include exclusions. Exclusions are real. There are way insurance policies govern risk. You need to know and it prohibits certain exclusions if you're requiring an additional insured provision. Second, that certificates of insurance issue is a huge deal. What a certificate of insurance says is, I did what you, I said I was going to do. It's a way that the whoever they are, the particular beer league, sends you something and says, yep, travelers, farmers, state farm, you're listed. And then if a claim comes up, you don't even have to deal with the beer league. You can just call up state farm and say, I've got a certificate of insurance. My particular insurance is secondary. You guys cover me primarily. So we've said a couple tips. Remember, you only get what the insurance policy gives you. Remember to get the certificate of insurance or mandate it in the contract. Specifically ask for the coverage you want. Prohibit the use of certain exclusions by saying things like, you are, your insurance policy will cover me for X or Y or Z. And then the last thing, tail coverage. This is an insurance term. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but it basically is saying, there's a period of time this coverage will exist that may be after the policy. I don't know if you'll get this every time, but if you want coverage, claims take years, right? All the time, I think my very, uh, the number one thing I hear from people when we get a claim is that lawsuit, oh my gosh, that incident happened five years ago. And lots of times you've lost their certificate of insurance or the insurance doesn't cover you at that time. And we're going to need tail coverage to say, hey, I was covered under this particular policy. And that's what it does. I, I put a picture of a dog there because of its tail. Uh, I think you understand the concept. It has nothing to do with dogs. So an additional insured is a tool used in addition to the indemnification and the duty to defend. It does not replace it, but it uses it in conjunction with it. I said this before, with indemnity and defense, you are assuming they have the money to cover you. With the additional insured provision, you're assuming they have the insurance policy to cover you. I'd like you to have both. Any questions about additional insured specifically before we just, we're just gonna to touch on some language I want you to use as government entities to keep your immunity. But other than that, we're pretty much done. I'm almost out of time. 
not seeing any. Okay, we'll leave it for the chat if you've got anything else at the end. All right, so the last topic I want to cover is specific to you as entities, and that's your immunity. And obviously, we, we have a million trainings on immunity. I've done a bunch of them. I'm sure I'll do more. Generally, I think you understand about immunity that there are certain claims as an entity you're immune from. Obviously, as employees, you're immune from tons of things, not intentional things, can't be drinking and driving, et cetera, but you're immune from many claims, and your entity is also immune from many claims. Um, I would say like a common one that comes up in our, in our contract discussion is if you were doing a stormwater issue or fixing the floodwaters, there's some really awesome immunities for storm drain and floodwaters. The minute you enter into a contract to do that. You sign a contract with somebody else and that goes sideways. And there's a breach of a contract claim, not a tort claim, not a you flooded my house claim, but an actual breach of contract. You've waived your immunity for that. You need to recognize that you do not have immunity from a breach of contract claim, which makes sense because if you're gonna enter into a contract, the law assumes that you're in control of whether you breach it or not. If we got immunity from those things, all hell would break loose. You could picture entities signing contracts they never intend to keep and breaching them all the time. So you need to be aware in your contract drafting, we don't have immunity from the breach of contract. But do we still have immunity from the underlying actions? Yes. Yes. So if they sue, if you signed a contract to, let's say, redo some stormwater systems or a flooding situation, and you get sued for the breach of contract, no immunity. But let's say you get sued by a homeowner for the management of floodwaters or storm drain. Do we have immunity arguments? Yes, we have them. I don't know if they'll work. The legislature's already always trying to take them away from us, but we've got them. What they will argue though is you've waived those argue, uh, immunity arguments by entering into the contract. I don't think that argument will necessarily work, but there is some language we encourage you to use to not waive your immunity. I'm going to share that language with you again, and I'll leave it up for a minute so you can see what I'm talking about and why it's important. This is sample immunity language. This is the type of language I would put in a contract to cover my bases. Do I think you're going to waive your immunity by entering into a contract? No, I don't think you're going to waive that immunity. Would I put this in every contract I was doing? Yeah, I probably would. This is language the trust likes. They've sent it out before. Um, all this is saying is when we're doing a contract, we are not waiving our procedural or substantive defenses that benefit the government or the Immunity Act. All right, I think everybody's kind of checked this out. They've seen it. This is the last thing I wanted to cover just about our immunity specifically. Um, there is an interesting case I'll just talk about quickly. I don't think it'll come up, but you should be careful. Remember when you're entering into contracts that oftentimes you're making individuals in the contract independent contractors, right? Now, some of you have done this with building inspectors or uh, Maybe you've got, uh, you're going to do some work on a road and you hire through a contract, these particular contractors. Normally your employees have immunity. There is a provision in the immunity act that says independent contractors do not get your immunity. And there's a difficult kind of, it's tough to see how that's going to work in practice. Frankly, there's a case of Mallory versus BYU where they had uh, some uh, contractors doing traffic control for the police department around there after a BYU game. Those guys got the immunity. But then most of the cases, they won't have the immunity. They'll have waived it. You need to be careful with this issue. I'm happy to talk offline about if you want to give immunity to your contractors, there's some things you can try to do. I don't know if it'll work. But you should be very careful when you're entering into contractors with independent contractors that you don't accidentally get them qualified as employees if you don't want them to be. Yes, it could get them some additional immunity, which is kind of you, 
But what you don't want is to have them all of a sudden municipal employees and they're entitled to certain benefits or, or uh, other types of things that you didn't intend to give them as an employee. Certain protections that I, I'm certain that you didn't contemplate in your contract drafting. So be aware that's an issue that's out there with our contracts. All right, so that's my training day. I've covered the material I wanted to cover. We've gone over indemnification, duty to defend, the additional insured provision, and then some immunity arguments. Again, always happy to take phone calls uh, on the hotline, anything like that about this. Happy to help out with different things. And obviously, if we've got a couple of minutes, I can answer some questions now. But um, either way, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come train on this and hope it's been helpful for you. Outstanding presentation, Matt. Really appreciate this information. Um, I do have a question here from, from Nix. Uh, it says, Matt, will you speak uh, to certification and authority of individuals to enter into a contract as a counterparty? Yeah, I could touch on it. Um, I assume based on your question, but you, I mean, you can call or correct me that you're talking about who can uh, enter into contracts for the entities. And there are some specifics. I mean, we're talking at a lot of different entities here. Your specific entity will cover exactly who can do that with whether it's a special service district, a county or a city. It's important to recognize the one issue that's tough that I have had quite a bit is you need to be clear in your forward facing policies who can do this because there are some doctrines about apparent authority. So even if it's somebody you don't think can enter into contracts, if the other side of the transaction believes they can, it can get us in some trouble. So your forward facing stuff should be clear about what kind of contracts the city or the county or the district can enter into and who can do those things. But generally speaking, you're not going to be able to enter into specific contracts without your authority of your uh, legislative body. I mean, that's almost, especially if you're spending any money at all. Um, as far as your specific situation and price, it would definitely be under your how you're organized and how you're operated. And we can speak offline to more specifics on that. But one issue I have seen come up quite a bit is I worked with this person. They said they could enter into a contract with the city. Do, and then you say they couldn't. And what's binding and what isn't. And so that's why I'd give you some advice that let's make sure our forward facing our communications with the public, it's clear how the city enters into contracts and what process you go through, or your district or your county or whoever your particular entity is. Hope that helps. Hard question, but I'm happy to answer it offline too. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I think this has been this has been great for me. I think it was, I think it was very clear, it allowed, allowed me to clear up some of those uh uh, hard parts of, of this process and, and the important inform, uh, information has been shared today. So thanks once again, Matt. Appreciate it so much. Um, and once again, folks, if you have questions or comments, uh, Matt says he's, he's available to answer some of those um, and we would love to help out as well. So thank you so much. Lots of kudos coming in there. Matt, final words? Uh, no, just give me a call if you need any help. Happy to help. We'll see you thank soon. You so